Well, welcome everybody to uh, the, I think, the third keynote presentation in Policy Exchange's uh, series on levelling up. Uh, I'm Paul Ormerod, I'll be chairing the meeting, and I'm a member of the uh, Policy Exchange's advisory uh, group on levelling up. Uh, I do a number of things, including being chairman of the uh, Rochdale Development Agency, uh, which of course is in Rochdale in Greater Manchester, so I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome uh, Richard Jones here today. Uh, Richard's had a, a very distinguished uh, academic career, and he's currently a professor in materials physics and innovation policy at the University of Manchester, and he was previously at the University of Cambridge and then uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at Sheffield University. Um, and at Manchester, there are two aspects to his work. He, 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 he contributes, he makes a major contribution uh, to the pioneering work in advanced materials that's currently uh, being carried out at Manchester, uh, where the university is home to several major national materials research centres, including the National Graphene Institute, the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, uh, and the Henry Royce Institute for Advanced Materials Research and Innovation. But the innovation policy part of his job title is important because Richard uh, combines not just distinguished academic work, uh, but he's heavily involved uh, with practical policy. And of course, at the Rochdale Development Agency, we work closely uh, with uh, Richard uh, and his colleagues. So without further ado, uh, Richard, over to you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here talking to uh, uh, you about uh, levelling up and R&D, particularly in this week, the week after the levelling up white paper came along. So if I could have my first slide, I just, I, I, what I'm going to talk about, I, I, I want to talk about uh, three things here. Next slide, please. I, I, I want to explain a little bit about why research and development is important in the levelling up debate, because I know R&D sounds a little bit abstruse, uh, but, but I think it's fundamentally important when we consider the productivity dimension of levelling up, which I think is really important. Uh, if I could have, uh, I want to talk about the white paper. I, I, of course, I want to say what, what I think about the white paper, what's good in it, what further work needs to be done. And then I want to, uh, to finish off by telling you a little bit about Greater Manchester and, uh, and illustrating in practice, I think, some of the issues that we're going to have to face when we try and use R&D as a lever in the levelling up armoury. So if I can have the next slide. Uh, I want to start just with this context. Why is levelling up important? Levelling up is important because the UK is an enormously divided country in terms of its economic performance. And if we look at productivity, uh, the, the, you know, essentially we've got a very high-performing northern European economy in the southeast. And, uh, stuck on the, uh, and that's kind of stuck on the bottom right-hand corner of a country which by and large re uh, resembles more southern Italy uh, or, or Spain. So uh, it, I think it's really important to understand the context. This is why I think it's really important that levelling up should be considered a major national project. Have the next slide. Um, I also need to remind you why productivity matters. Uh, uh, since uh, between 1970 and the, the mid-2000s, uh, labour productivity grew at an astonishingly steady rate, 2.3% a year. Uh, uh, and after the global financial crisis, that trend broke. And uh, uh, in fact, if we currently we're about 24% uh, down on where we would have been if productivity had continued at that, that previous rate. Have the, the, the next one. Why does this matter? This matters because productivity and wages uh, track each other. So the fact that we've just seen a decade, more than a decade of wage stagnation, uh, translates uh, is a direct consequence of that slowdown in productivity. And productivity is what uh, is one of the, the, the dispersions of productivity across the country, uh, one of the things that holds the country back and that leads to the, the, this need to level up. So the next slide. So this uh, diagram taken from the levelling up white paper uh, shows what, what, uh, what, what I'm talking about. We live in a country that's kind of an anti-Lake Wobegon country, if those of you who remember Prairie Home, Home Companion. Uh, almost all the country is below average. Uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, 
the, the high productivity in, in London, particularly in the southeast, uh, kind of masks the fact that most of the country is just really not doing very well in terms of, uh, in terms of its productivity. And I think that I, I'm really pleased that the Leveling White, White Paper takes this as being one of its really important starting points. If I have the next slide. Uh, I think a really important point to, to make about this is that this dispersion in productivity translates directly into um, uh, uh, the, the contributions that different parts of the country make. And uh, I think this is a really important political point because I think a lot of people are framing levelling up as being somehow this is going to be where we're taking money from the, uh, the, the, the prosperous London and the South East, and we're shoveling it north to, 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 to the North and the Midlands and Wales and, and Northern Ireland. The truth is, we already shovel enormous quantities of money up north. Uh, so, so only three regions of the UK contribute more to the government than they receive. So at the moment, we've got a situation where the very strong economies of uh, London and the South East particularly are really what's holding up living standards, public services in the rest of the country. So I think the way that one should frame levelling up, levelling up is a way of it, uh, it, we need to give uh, the, the rest of the country the tools it needs to be able to raise its productivity so that London keep, can keep more of its own money. So that's my kind of strap line for levelling up in, in an audience in, 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 in London. Uh, you need to, uh, we need to make the rest of the country uh, pay its own way so that London and the South East can, can keep the money that they generate. OK, what's this got to do with R&D, if I can have the next slide? So research and development uh, is, uh, you, you know, one thinks of research and development as being uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of thing that's, that, ha that happens in shiny research institutes, uh, of which we have many very high-performing ones. But I think fundamentally, the kind of research and development that we should be more interested in is the private sector research and development, which is the route by which firms create new high-value products and they improve their processes to re reduce costs. So all the kind of the, 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 the great products that we use in everyday life, in technology, the, 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 the products that keep us healthy, the vaccine, of course, being the most, uh, uh, the, the vaccines being the most prominent example, these are the product of systematic innovation carried out in the private sector. So formal innovation, uh, for, uh, you know, I should stress, R&D isn't the only type of innovation. There are other types of innovation, innovation in business models, innovation in service delivery. But fundamentally, R&D is uh, the formal process by which uh, companies can innovate. And about half of the, 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 the expenditure that companies in the UK spend on innovation goes into R&D. But the key point is that economics tells us that left to themselves, companies won't invest as much in R&D as would be socially optimal because uh, uh, you can't keep new ideas in a firm forever. Other people copy things. It's, uh, it's, one, one can't appropriate all the benefits of R&D. And that's the, the, the kind of classical economic justification for why the government needs to fund R&D. And uh, extensive uh, literature tells us that that private sector R&D, uh, in the jargon of the, the, the field, crowds in more private sector R&D. And then it's that private sector R&D that leads to higher productivity growth. And there's uh, quite a lot of evidence. Can I have the next bit, please? Uh, on this, uh, that, that kind of attempts to quantify the kind of spillovers that you get. You get estimated rates of, of return on public R&D of about 20% uh, per annum. Uh, so uh, it's been estimated, this is a work particularly by Jonathan Haskell, who's now a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, who's done perhaps the best work on this area, that uh, a 10% rise in public R&D would raise private total uh, factor productivity growth by about <clears throat> 0.03 percentage points per annum. So that, that, that's the justification for why we think R&D matters. OK, so who, where, where does R&D get spent? The next one. Uh, so, so this plot shows how regionally concentrated R&D spending is. So this is a plot that shows both business R&D and uh, private sector R&D. And uh, there, there are a few points I'd make about this. The, the, the next, uh, 
Uh, the, the first is that London, together with the two sub-regions that contain Oxford and Cambridge, uh, can, uh, account for 46% of all public and charitable spending on, on R&D. They have 21% of the, the, the UK's population. So we have an enormous concentration of, uh, of public sector R&D in London and the South East. Uh, and what's more, public sector funding is actually even more concentrated than private sector funding. And I'll come back to that point because I think it's important in terms of where we get the best value for money for, from the public sector investment. And uh, it's no surprise uh, that, that, uh, that, 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 that there's a correlation between the, 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 those parts of the country that have lower productivity are parts of the country where there's less, uh, less R&D. It's not, I, I, I will say it's not totally obvious which direction the causality goes in this case, but the, the correlation is very clear. If I can have the next slide. So, so there's an interesting uh, mismatch between the way the public spe sector spends its money on R&D and the way that pri the private sector spends its money on R&D. And so this plot, uh, my colleague Tom Forth was, I think, the first person to plot the data this way, and I think it's actually a really revealing graph. So on this graph, what you see is on, on, on the x-axis, you've got the government, higher education and non-profit R&D in euros per person. Uh, and on the y-axis, we've got business R&D. And if I have the next, go on a bit. We can really see that, that there are four different uh, regions. Uh, roughly speaking, on average, and this is a kind of relationship that holds actually not just for the UK, but for many economies like ours, uh, there's a roughly two to one ratio between the, 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 the money that the, the private sector spends on R&D and the public sector. So roughly speaking, uh, you put a pound of public money into R&D, you get two pounds of private sector money. That's, that, that, that seems to work. In Far Eastern countries, actually, the ratio is, is bigger. They, they, they get more private sector R&D for, for, for their public sector investment. But for Western European countries, the United States, that seems to work. So if we have the next bit, please. So what we can see is we've got some regions that have got high public R&D and high business R&D. So eastern, the east of England and the southeast, particularly the east of England, are, these are knowledge-intensive economies that we need to emulate. This is when, when, when things are working, this is what you get. You get uh, uh, um, the, the state putting in uh, substantial amounts of, uh, of R&D funding, but the private sector piling in behind that with much more uh, uh, R&D spending that then gets converted into jobs and growth. Uh, London is kind of interesting because London has a very high uh, public sector R&D spend, but actually rather a low private sector spend. Whereas in the left-hand quadrant, top left-hand quadrant, you've actually got some very interesting places because here you've got places where the private sector is investing in R&D and the public sector is not following that. So our argument would be that actually what you're seeing there are some market signals where, the, the, where companies are making choices about investment and the state is not backing them up. Uh, then finally, at the bottom left, you've got uh, areas like uh, Wales, the North East and Yorkshire, where, which are actually rather non-innovative -in economies where they're, they're both uh, public and private sector uh, um, don't invest very much. OK, so... Uh, Th th there's a problem. We don't. Uh, R and D spending is geographically concentrated in the places that are most prosperous. Uh, I, I argue that uh, we, we would get substantial levelling up benefit by 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 spreading that R and D around. What's the scale of the problem? Can have the next slide. If we are, if we ask, what's the extra revenue spending that you'd need to put in to level up? Uh, per capita spending to the average of London, the East, and the South East. And by that I mean the whole of the, 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 the South East. I'm not focusing on Oxford and Cambridge anymore, but this is for the whole of that, that prosperous part of the country. Turn up the next bit. We'll see the numbers. The, the numbers look like this. It, you'd need to spend about 1.6 billion per annum more in the North. Uh, you'd need to spend uh, 1.4 billion per annum in the Midlands, about 570 million in uh, the Southwest, and 660 million in Wales and Northern Ireland. And the total that comes to is 4.2 billion, and that uh, gave us the title for the uh, paper that I wrote with Tom Forth for Nesta a couple of years ago called The Missing Four Billion. 
And uh, I'd just like to set that, that, that number in context. So that number is, uh, um, it's, it's a big number. It, th 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 these, aren't, th th these aren't small sums. But in the context of the, 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 the recent uh, government uh, commitment to, to spend more money on R&D, it's actually not unreasonable. Uh, that, so as we'll see, the, the government plans an increase in the CSR period of five billion. Now, one of the things that people uh, have often come back to us, to, to, to Tom Forth and I, when we make these kinds of arguments, is, well, we've known this for a long time and we've tried to, to change things, but nothing's ever worked. And I just need to have another number, if I can get the next bit up. Uh, another number is the last time uh, that some, somebody made a serious attempt, well, not really a serious attempt, an, an attempt was made to, to rebalance R&D spending was through the English regional development agencies in the, uh, in the 2000s. And actually, the total that was spent then between 2005 and 2008 was 323 million. So I think that the reason why this didn't work was that this was just not applied at a scale that would make a difference. Well, we're in a different environment now. If I can, uh, 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 we, we've had a comprehensive spending review that announced genuine, significant increases in R&D spending. So this shows uh, that, uh, that, that, that there's a... Uh, the, 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 the spending review uh, puts in train an increase from about 15 billion a year now to about 20 billion in 2024. And it also made the very welcome commitment that, uh, that of that money, an increased share of the record increase in government spending will be invested outside the Greater Southeast. So the Comprehensive Spending Review made this broad brush commitment. And uh, this brings us up to the, the Leveling Up White Paper. Uh, where uh, we see how this is going to be uh, put into practice. So if I can see, the, the levelling up white paper, I think, has welcome high-level principles. I think there are still open questions on the implementation. And uh, I, I think it does introduce an important pilot policy of innovation accelerators, which I think do offer us a roadmap to locally informed innovation policy that I think is very much in the spirit of the other parts of the white paper in ter terms of devolving more decision-making power and responsibility to nations, cities, and regions. So uh, the, the, the white paper is, of course, a very interesting document, uh, and uh, I th think the analytical framework is actually really rather valuable. Uh, there's this capitals framework, but I, I, I want to just pick, uh, bring out one point that I think is a really important point, and I was really pleased to see it made in, in the white paper, and that's this idea of vicious cycles. So uh, the problem with... Uh, uh, underperforming economies in the north, typically deindustrialized towns, is that we have low wage, low skill economies that lead to a vicious cycle where, where skills leave, uh, the, 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 there isn't the demand for people to get skills, people who do have skills uh, uh, get up and go, then that leads to low investment in innovation and R&D. And I think a really important point of the, of the white paper, which is a kind of difficult one for politicians to sell because it's, it's hard, is that these are interlinking problems that you need to address more than one bit of this vicious cycle to, to, to make progress. So the, I was very pleased to see that productivity was absolutely at the, uh, at the, the heart. We have a focus area of this goal of boosting productivity, pay jobs and living standards by growing the private sector, especially in places where they're lagging. So we've got a goal, we've got a, a, an overarching outcomes-based mission, so living standards, there's an there's aspiration that by 2030 we'll see uh, closing in the gap in employment and productivity and uh, globally competitive cities uh, uh, in each area. And then this then gets, uh, we then have some intermediate inputs which are based on this mission. So, so we have this high level statement committing to a, a, an increase in R&D outside the greater southeast of at least 40%. Uh, by one third over the spending review period. So these are kind of, uh, these are crunchy targets. It has to be said, actually, that, 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 that the one third target, of course, is actually not calling for a substantial rebalancing, uh, that, that that actually would more or less keep the ratio the same, but it would at least increase the, uh, the, the totals. Now, there's some issues here about rebalancing R&D. R&D isn't just a simple thing where you just kind of turn a knob and pour more money in and then productivity comes out the other way. 
there are actually quite a lot of uh, things that we want to we, we, we want to discuss. So we need to think: how do you how do you um, how do you preserve excellence? So the reason why lots of money goes to Cambridge is because there are lots of brilliant people in Cambridge and they do fantastic work. And uh, in kind of competitive processes like uh, grant processes, they rightly do well. So everything, you know, nothing one says here should say that we should do anything to damage those parts of the system that are really high performing. And I would say that, uh, that, that you know, we're lucky to have really high performing research institutions in, in, in the greater southeast. But there is a question about what do we mean by, 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 by excellence? And that, 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 um, you know, there's excellence as defined by our scientific peers, but there's also different kinds of excellence. There's a kind of excellence that translates into, you know, producing a product that people want to buy or that, has, that, or, or, or that saves lives. And they don't always align. And there's a, a, an issue about where you focus on the spectrum from basic research to applied and development work. And when it comes to thinking about levelling up, there's a really important po point about what kind of R&D is the right R&D to support an existing regional industrial or in innovation ecosystem. Uh, it, it's kind of, um, you know, there's been a, a, there was a great glut across the world in the 2000s particularly of countries across the world deciding we want to have a biotechnology cluster. You find some uh, uh, some struggling community. You shove a shiny building in it that, that that's devoted to really high tech biotech. It doesn't do anything for the economy because it's not connected to the economy that's already there. And I think that that leads to this idea of you know regional absorptive capacity. How do you build the capacity in a lagging economy to 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 to, uh, to, to absorb new technology? And then finally, the, the the final question is, you know, what's who, which organisation is the right information to make good decisions? Can this all be done from Whitehall? I think the answer is no. I don't even think it can be done from Swindon, which is where the research councils are currently based. I think we need to get this idea of much more national co-creation or devolution uh, with uh, national cities, uh, with regions or cities. Of course, the counter-argument to that is that you need to have capacity. You need to have people in those cities and regions who are able to make good decisions, who are technologically un informed, who understand the nature of their business base. And I think that's a, the conundrum that I'll come to at the end of my talk. So if I can talk about, OK, the nuts and bolts about where this is going to happen. So uh, R&D, the government spends a lot of money on R&D, and it spends it in different places. It spends it in UKRI, United Kingdom Research and Innovation, which essentially supports basic research in institutes and uh, uh, in, in universities and institutes. But other, um, uh, uh, other uh, organisations are really important too. I can, uh, uh, there's a lot of R&D in support of government goals, mm -hmm. for example, uh, just in, in industrial strategy, in uh, the, the, the National Institute of Health Research and Ministry of Defence. And actually, if we look into the detail of the Comprehensive Spending Review, quite a lot of the uplift in R&D is actually in those departments rather in UKRI. And I think that's important. So what have we got to do if we move to... Uh, um, I think UKRI and Innovate UK do need some degree of culture change. I think, uh, you know, it's... a uh, they tend to say we don't do regional policy, regional strategy. The Leveling Up paper says they need, they need to do that. And if I can have the, uh, just, just run through these, these points. Uh, we have a commitment from Bayes to invest 55% of R&D funding outside the Greater South East. I think there's a, a commitment to factor levelling up into investment decisions for infrastructure. And there's an important point that UKRI now has a, an organisational uh, uh, um, objective to deliver levelling up. But I think there's still work to be done. There's still details here. And I will point out that UKRI did have a, uh, a, a very prominent uh, place-based instrument, the Strength in Places Fund. And I think it's disappointing that the white paper didn't contain a commitment to, to, to continue that. If I can look at the next one. Uh, NIHR is a very important funder of health research. And this, I think, relates to another of the levelling up uh, 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 missions, life expectancy. Life expectancy health outcomes vary hugely across the country. Factors of 10 years 
uh, between uh, the prosperous southeast and the, 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 the deindustrialized north. Uh, and I, uh, it's right that I think there's a mission to close those gaps, but NIHR is the organization to do it. But this plot here shows NIHR spending is currently enormously concentrated in, in London. So I would really like to see more commitment from, uh, from NIHR to spend more of its uplift in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in reducing health uh, disparities. So uh, the final thing I want to talk about is the this, this, this question of devolution. To what extent can we devolve <coughs> Uh, um, uh, uh, money and responsibility to cities and regions. And here I think there's a very welcome um, uh, commitment, these, the, these innovation accelerators. So uh, the commitment is for a, a relatively small investment in the scale of the whole thing to three innovation accelerators in Greater <coughs> Manchester, West Midlands and Glasgow. And the idea here is where we've got existing R&D strengths, as well as strong local governance and strong leadership, uh, we can start to work to develop the innovation clusters that we've got, grow R&D strengths, particularly to attract private sector investment. We'd like, we'd, we'd like to see more uh, foreign direct investment particularly, uh, and uh, uh, to, 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 to boost the diffusion of innovation. So uh, you know, I think there's a widespread understanding now that it's not enough simply to invent cool gadgets. Lots of the work of product, developing productivity is about bringing existing technologies into firms uh, and uh, supporting them in, in, in using new technology. So I, 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 I'm very happy to see this Innovation Accelerator commitment. I think they will empower local areas uh, and uh, it's going to be an interesting experiment to see how we get this to work. So Greater Manchester uh, was, I think, uh, ahead of trying to work out what to do. Uh, and, and so we've already created an organisation called Innovation Greater Manchester. Uh, and that's uh, it's private sector led. So if, uh, it's, um, it, it's very closely connected to the combined authorities, so the mayoral authority, very strongly endorsed by our leadership uh, and uh, involves... Uh, all the universities, and uh, I'm, I'm working uh, with, with it as its scientific advisor. And our goal really is to uh, develop a pipeline of projects that will drive productivity across the whole of GM. And uh, I think it needs to be outward looking work with other cities too. So, if I can have the next slide. And in fact, the next one. So, we've, we, we announced this a few months ago uh, before that. <coughs> a couple of points I want to make. Leveling up is not just a problem of leveling up between the southeast and, uh, and, and the Midlands and the north. Within Greater Manchester, there are equally profound disparities. So, uh, uh, in Greater Manchester, north, north, uh, northeast Greater Manchester, comprising Rochdale, Bury, Oldham, these are actually some of the least, uh, 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 the lowest productivity, lowest living standards uh, places in the whole northwest. So even though I think Manchester, to many people, people have the vision of Manchester, of um, you know the, the new buildings in the centre, the great developments that have happened in the centre, the new institutes, National Graphene Institute in Salford, we've got you know Salford Keys and the BBC, it all looks really rather marvellous. Uh, the truth is. Manchester, Greater Manchester's 2.8 million people, as a conurbation, it is performing below the national average. So as a, a major city should be driving the growth of the whole uh, of the north, it's really underperforming. And that's because within Greater Manchester, we still have these huge disparities. And uh, th those, again, reflect in, 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 in health, too. So we have the health, very profound health inequalities within Greater Manchester, as well as across the, the, the UK. And these health inequalities, of course, map onto economic imbalances. And, uh, um, you know, I'm a physicist, so this is my kind of bit of folk social science view, but my reading of this is pretty straightforward. People in poor places have bad health, and then... Uh, an unhealthy population then is itself a drag on productivity. And we can see this doing work in, in places like Oldham. We have low participation rates in the labour market, low levels of skills that are directly related to the, to, to, to the very poor health outcomes. We see those poor health outcomes in turn come from factors like bad housing 
and uh, essentially from, from poverty. So I, I think it's really important that public health and regional economic development need to go together. I'm pleased to see that they were both missions in the uh, levelling up white paper. They're not as far apart as uh, one might think. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, we've got a very big evidence base, if I can just rattle through these bits. Lots of uh, analysis has been done on the nature of the greater Manchester economy. Uh, again, it's important to say we've got different, uh, uh, different bits of the economy. So we, if I have that next one. We've got 10 different boroughs, and uh, you know these have quite different sp sector specialisms. So the right kinds of interventions for central Manchester are not the right interventions for, for, for Wigan or for Rochdale or for Bury. And I think it's really important, the kind of local knowledge that this sort of local organisation can bring to this is really important, I think, for, for, for doing the right interventions that really will uh, drive particularly private sector innovation. So uh, we, we need to think about innovation districts in the city centre. So, so uh, we, we have some uh, very substantial plans for innovation districts that will be uh, building on the strengths in artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, but then we also need to think about the manufacturing innovation parts, the institutions we need for innovation diffusion. Uh, things that build, uh, so, so American, uh, uh, American theorists Pisano and she talk about the industrial commons, that kind of collective knowledge that successful manufacturing uh, communities have, where people share innovations, where you've got skills institutions that are all uh, contributing to, to, to keep uh, innovation at the, the heart of what's going on. And so in Rochdale, uh, as Paul knows, uh, we've got very exciting development with the Advanced Machinery and Productivity Institute in collaboration with the National Physical Laboratory, aiming to build the innovation capacity of the machine tool industry uh, and uh, that, that aspect of manufacturing in that very uh, currently very underperforming bit of the Northwestern economy. And we need to think about innovation and skills in the centres of outlying towns. And if I can have the next one, I think this leads to, you know, we, we, you have to do a lot of detailed work. I'm involved in a piece of work in Oldham. Oldham is, uh, uh, again, one of the poorest communities in, in, in the north of England. And, uh, um, you know, one needs to go and talk to the businesses, you need to talk to the communities, you need to find out what actually would be the kinds of interventions that can make a difference. So if I can conclude, uh, I think levelling up R&D, R&D is a really important part of the productivity enhancing investments that I think should be at the centre of the levelling up agenda. I don't think levelling up should be thought of in terms of just moving money from successful places to le less successful places to, you know, we do a lot of that already and it's right that we do, but I think we ought to be thinking very seriously about what are the investments that we can make that will enhance the productivity of those parts of the country that are not doing very well? R&D is not the only one, but I think it's an important part of it. So I'm very pleased that the white paper uh, sets this as, uh, as one of its missions. Uh, I think that uh, some work still needs to be done to, uh, to, to translate these high-level commitments into you know, the changes, how things actually happen on the ground in a research council or in Innovate UK or in the bits of, uh, uh, of MOD that decide where to spend their money. Uh, I think that we need to, to, to work, I think, ultimately devolution, co-creation, call it what you like, of R&D &R programmes with city regions that have developed the capacity, that have got the leadership, that have got the connections to the private sector, that's really important to incorporate that local knowledge and that local responsibility. And I think the innovation accelerators are a pretty good first step. So my final point is, you, you know, w w how would, would I sum up good innovation policy? I think you know, good innovation policy is basically finding out who's doing the innovating and helping them do more of it. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.
Professor, can, can I just start off with a, with a couple of points that you mentioned uh, diffusion, which of course is uh, you know, a major issue. There is it was identified and the whole thing. Yeah, the plus of these talks here. There's a long tail within every industry of low low performing productivity targets, um, and it's mentioned very frequently in the white paper itself. Uh, there's a section on this. Um, have you any ideas about how you know how this might be uh, carried out? Like you say, it's one thing to do high quality research; it's one thing for leading firms uh, to do that. But how do we actually try and spread it out a bit more? Um, and I suppose, I mean, the second point is what it follows on really from your very final point, which um, I very much agree with in a sense. Leveling up the entire country, as you pointed out, you know, is a massive task. You know, the West Germans haven't really succeeded in leveling up East Germany, and they spent two trillion euros. So you're suggesting there that, in a sense, initially, we try and level up some places by concentrating resources on areas like Greater Manchester or like the West Midlands who've shown initiative and are taking steps themselves rather than being the passive recipients of, if you like, public sector large yes. So I mean, the two, the two uh, if you could perhaps make a few comments on that, that'll, that'll open up the, uh, the, the discussion. Yeah, sure. So on the innovation diffusion front, that is really important. I think, you know, again, in Greater Manchester, so we've been uh, lucky in that uh, we, we've seen the, 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 the Made Smarter programme that Jürgen Meyer, former uh, CEO of Siemens UK, set up with, with, with Bayes. And I think it's been a successful program in terms of uh, getting people to go to uh, companies and s support them in using particularly uh, new IT technology. And the idea was to, to, to introduce manufacturing companies, particularly to industry 4.0 techniques, industrial digitalization. So I think that's, that, that's been promising. I think many, many countries have uh, specific institutions devoted to innovation diffusion. Um, one, one thinks of the United States has uh, the Manufacturing USA program, where, where it's essentially a manufacturing extension program. Uh, uh, Japan has uh, uh, essentially innovation diffusion centers that, that, that are, uh, run regionally. Uh, so, so these are places where absolutely the focus is on developing skills, introducing um, uh, firms to, to, to the possibilities of what new technology can offer. And I think that's a gap in our landscape. We've not really done that. The catapult centers, some of the catapult centers have, you know, have in effect done that. So uh, AMRC in Sheffield, Warwick Manufacturing Group in Coventry have done activities that are like that. But in a sense, it's not actually part of their core mission and they've done it because they think it ought to be done. I think we could be more systematic about uh, uh, creating those institutions that have as an explicit goal building capability, building industrial capability. Uh, and I think, as I say, there are some interesting international examples of countries that have done that well. Okay, thanks. Um, if I can confirm the, uh, the impact of Made Smart, I mean, uh, watched it online, which I'm sure nobody else follows. So there's, there's a story almost every other week uh, about firms uh, taking uh, advantage of this. But would anybody um, here in the uh, present here would like to uh, start with uh, with the first question? Ah, oh, yeah, sure. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, I just want to pick Can up you just say, say who you are? Sorry, Sorry I'm Robert Ede. I lead health work here at Policy Exchange. Um, you talked a bit about health disparities uh, in your instance and showed an example of what you described as um, poor places leading to worse outcomes. Um, what do you think about the missions and how they're framed? Is the time frame realistic to you? Most of them are 2030 or 2035. The healthy life expectancy one is also ambitious. Do you think that feels achievable for a region like Greater Manchester to be delivering results by 2030? I, I think it's very ambitious. And I, I, you know, to be frank, I think that the, the details of the, 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 the health inequality are you know, that is sketchy to the point that I've got no idea what they're planning to do. You know, we're promised a white paper. I think, you know, it's been a real uh, blank spot in, in, in UK policy for, 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 for some time. 
So I think you know these are really challenging problems. They, ha you know, we've not particularly focused on them. You know, tellingly, uh, I think it was Jen Williams's article in the Manchester Evening News kind of brought out that point that you know. The, the, the white paper talked about building new hospitals. It didn't talk about how to stop people getting into hospitals. And there's a huge piece of work to be done in uh, supporting population health, healthy aging, keeping people out of hospital, keeping people healthy. You know, quite a lot of digital innovation can go into that. But uh, you know, we wait to see a, a, a framework for that. I and mean, it is something that Manchester's in principle, in a good place to do because we have this devolution of health and social care, which is clearly part of it. But you know, of course, there are kind of enormously difficult pressures on all kinds of health services at the moment that make it even more difficult. So yeah, it's great that it's a mission, but it's going to be not easy. I just said, matter of logistic, Richard. I think you, you can't relax on a chair. I think you have to stand at the lectern so people can see you uh, online. So, Sorry. Uh, online. Uh, uh, can we take, if I can take a question uh, from uh, somebody's online, uh, Kim Davids, who's the head of the Chief Executive Office at the uh, Design Council. Great. Are you there, Kim? Are you unmuted? Sorry, hi. It's, it's Kat, I think, actually. I'm the Chief Design Officer at the Design Council. Um, so my question is around design. Um, design is core to R&D and innovation because it turns ideas into commercial products and services that people want to buy. Sorry, Kim, can, can you just can you speak up a bit? It's not coming through very well here. It might be our technology, but if you could, I think we're, we're struggling slightly to hear. So if you, if you sort of shout it, that would be better. Okay, I will speak very loudly. Um, design is core to R&D and innovation because it turns ideas into commercial products and services. And we know a pound invested in design creates 20 pounds in return. And those with design skills are 47% more productive than the UK average. But we also know like R&D investment, it's concentrated in the Southeast and 40% of businesses don't use design at all. So what role do you see uh, for design, especially as it relates to some of the more traditional skills of making and manufacturer that are inherent in levelling up areas? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree entirely. Design's really important, and I think, you know, that there needs to be more uh, interaction between design and the, the kind of hard science and engineering. You know, for myself, I, I, you know, my day job is being a material scientist, in, a, in effect, and I think... Um, currently, I think a lot of design, there's too much of a gulf, if you like, between designing a material and then designing a product. And, uh, you know, some, some years ago, we had some very uh, interesting and exciting um, uh, collaborations with uh, designers like Sebastian Conran uh, to, to try and c close that loop. So I think very, very, very much that, uh, that, that, that the design is really important in innovation in traditional manufacturing as much as in uh, you know the more uh, what people think of as being the, the creative industries so I think uh, it, it's, it's it's really important to bring those that, that those two areas together hello afternoon um, thank you for a great talk uh, my name is Ike J I'm head of um, housing, architecture, and urban space at some policy exchange. Um, but my question is more a historic one. Um, what role, if any, do you think R&D played in this flatlining of UK productivity that took place in the mid-2000s, particularly within the context of the various devolutions that had happened just beforehand at the end of the last decade? I appreciate the Prescott Regional Assembly devolutions didn't happen, but we had devolution in London, Scotland, Wales. Um, so, yeah, um, R&D... Um, within that context, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there was a. I, I, I mean, I think the answer is I don't think devolution made a huge amount of difference. I think there were big changes in the R and D landscape in the late '90s and early 2000s, both in terms of um, uh, the changes in the particularly in the industrial landscape. You saw 
big companies like ICI and GEC essentially, first of all, being broken up and then essentially failing. So, uh, you, you know, if you look at the figures, you do see a big drop in R&D intensity. In fact, I mean, if you go back to 1980, the UK actually was uh, one of the most R&D intensive countries in the world in 1980. And uh, that changed over the next 15 years as a result, you know, both the kind of corporate re reorganisations that, that, that took place, which took out a lot of uh, uh, commercial R&D capacity and uh, changes, particularly in, not so much in universities, but in uh, government-supported uh, uh, R&D labs. I mean, there was a withdrawal, essentially, by government from applied R&D as a matter of policy in the kind of starting out in the late, late 80s. And that I think fed through to a, uh, uh, you know, a loss, particularly of public sector research establishments, as well as these big industrial labs. And I, you know, you'll have to ask a proper economist how much of the change in productivity one can ascribe to that. You know, that, that there's an extensive and not totally satisfying literature about what caused the productivity slowdown. But um, since uh, R and D is the thing I think about. Point to that. <laughs> well, possibly an economist I could make a comment and say, I mean, it is, it is not just a UK issue, it's, uh, it's an international one. And if that's the case, we would say that there will, there will be some specific features for each country, but it's a general problem, so there must be general issues. And I'm afraid, you know, uh, like many issues, economists haven't yet solved this problem. Uh, so uh, that's, 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 that's my comment on that. Uh, but can I take now to say, um, Sorry, oh, that's fine. Um, David Hughes online, who's director of the Business Innovation Group. David. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, Richard, thank you for that uh, presentation. I, I think it's always very helpful when presenters um, give some solutions or some ideas of how things are going to be implemented. So I, I, I must recognize that and give you praise for that. Um, and let me just go back and challenge some of your evidence base. Uh, you talked about the RDAs and their funding, you know, a few hundred million, I think, 380 or something you mentioned. Um, that's out of kilter with uh, a number of other reports that I've seen. So, for example, there was a PwC report in 2009, which explained over the period of the RDAs, the funding averaged 1.9 billion. And that's a significant amount, which was, uh, which was grabbed by the coalition government and uh, reduced with a fraction of funding for the uh, local enterprise partnerships. And in my view, that has a significant impact on what was going on because by the time that change was done, the regional development agencies were really gaining momentum, particularly in the Midlands and the Northwest, and becoming a real powerhouse. And if they'd been allowed to continue, would have gone further. So I think that's the first thing on your evidence base. I think you need to just check the numbers on that. Second one is we talk a lot about R&D expenditures, and it's worth just going back and seeing how these are compiled because in many cases, uh, particularly from a business point of view, they're compiled from uh, company accounts and statistics like that. But there are many expenditures, particularly on the development side, which never get into the R&D line in the accounts. And we've heard from the Design Council, Design is one of them. But you look at uh, many things like um, uh, civil engineering consultants, they, they quite often don't uh, report it. Many companies now are capitalizing their R&D, so you never see an R&D line as such in their accounts. So I think there's a big question mark as to the data that we've got around R&D, is it really capturing the development work that is really going on in businesses? And I think that undermines a lot of the um, conclusions which are drawn from some of those statistics. Yeah. So my specific question to you is this, you were a leading light okay. Okay. in the Industrial Strategy Commission, uh, made some recommendations and reports to government Industrial strategy, despite the fact that it still remains as part of Bay's uh, title, seems to have been quietly dropped. Nobody talks about it anymore. Uh, what advice can you give to people who want to change the landscape in terms of really influencing government ministers to actually do something rather than just putting it in a pigeonhole and ignoring it? Yeah. Okay. So to, to start with the RDAs, my, my 323 million was specifically the RDA expenditure on innovation. I know the total spend was larger than that, 
but that was the figure that was derived from the Sainsbury review of the RDA, uh, the RDAs in the, the 2009 or so. So no, I, I, I agree that the total impact of RDAs was larger, but they spent money on many things that weren't R&D, and so as I say, that was a specific innovation line. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was the source of that number. In terms of the statistics, I, I mean, first of all, the general point is, of course, correct that you know there is more to innovation than than, than R and D. And uh, the, the, the 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 innovation survey that uh, ONS publishes breaks down different forms of uh, spending that companies do on innovation. And yeah, as I say, R and D comes out about half of it. Uh, that the ONS. Uh, uh, business innovation numbers come from the survey. They come from a survey that, that's done. So in a sense, that's company. It's not actually from from, from a, 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 a annual accounts. It's from companies filling in the survey. What's really interesting, of course, is we've got another source of information on business R and D now. So we've got the tax credit data. So uh, uh, um, because of the great increasing generosity of the the, the, the R and D tax credit scheme. Uh, uh, HMRC now has data of how much money companies claim back for um, uh, for, for, for R and D, uh, and it, it's certainly true as the uh, as the R and D tax credit scheme has become more widely known. It's uh, and you know there's currently a consultation now about how uh, uh, whether to extend it further. There's been actually a divergence in the uh, in the numbers that you get from the bird survey and from the uh, the R and D tax credit. Uh, work. So I think, you know, um, you know, in fact, a general point of, that, that came out from the white paper, which, you know, from the government side as well as from the, uh, the business side, actually, in many cases, the statistics we have on this stuff is not actually, uh, are not actually that reliable. And, you know, it's a, probably just a welcome effect of the, um, uh, 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 of the white paper that actually people call to just take a bit more care about compiling those statistics. And, you know, from that, that's the kind of evidence base that we need to to work with. Uh, yeah, industrial strategy. Um, you know, I, I, uh, people always complain about uh, policy churn in government. Uh, Andy Haldane, I suppose, has reappeared from the Industrial Strategy Council into the, uh, the, 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 the Department of Leveling Up, so maybe there's some personal, con personal continuity, and if there isn't institutional continuity. Yeah, I don't know. How do you try and influence policy? I don't know. I do my best. Okay, any more questions from the uh, hand up? Actually, sorry, the, I think Connor, you were uh, you were first. Thanks. Uh, you made a really compelling case. Uh, sorry, Connor McCall, uh, head of economic uh, policy exchange. Uh, you made a really compelling case about um, the importance to encourage local growth. But um, the National Audit Office last week came out with a report saying that the government's actually quite bad in measuring local growth that aren't aggregate national statistics. Do you have any tips or um, ideas or suggestions on how government can better measure kind of local interventions in a way that over, over a relatively shorter period than 2030, you could assess um, progress on the missions uh, without getting to 2030 and realizing some of your interventions didn't actually work? Yeah, I, I, well, you know, I think there's an interesting philosophical point, isn't it? Governments measure what they're interested in and uh, five years ago, they didn't really work, work very interested in local growth, so they didn't measure very much. I think ONS has made big, big, big uh, uh, advances. I think the situation is much better now than it was even five years ago. I mean, my my, my co co-author on the missing four billion, Tom Forth from the Open Data Institute, is the person who talks about this stuff all the time, and he's very well informed. And you know, I think, I mean, I know he, he's been doing his best to. To, to get more data from all kinds of different sources. So I think, yeah, o o ONS is, uh, is, is getting better. I think the, the white paper will uh, prompt, you know, departments like, uh, I mean, I think MOD and, uh, in fact, actually, if you look at the white paper, there are actually some, some little wrinkles about the numbers in there that uh, I'm not sure I totally believe. And when you scratch them, they don't quite say what they, if you scratch the sources, they don't quite say what I think the white papers, as they say. So uh, th 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 there's work to be done. I and mean, the other thing to say, you know, something that we can do at a local level, uh, you know, we, we, we've been st starting doing this, is we can use innovative new methods to, 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 
to, to work out where, you know, the, the problem is, okay, GM, 2.8 million people, loads of businesses, many of them, many, many innovative businesses. How do we find those, those innovative businesses? And so we've been working, for example, with the, the Open Data Institute, to, you know, combination of web scraping tools and uh, machine learning, actually to go and identify automatically, if you like, where we think it's likely that those innovative businesses are. So, so there's kind of new stuff that we can do with data as well. Yeah, can I put, I'll just comment on that. I'm, I'm an economist, but I'm also a visiting professor in computer science at UCL. Um, and so I'm very interested. There's, a, there's, a very, there's quite a lot of material in the white paper on trying to how, uh, urging the development of very local area, very local statistics. I think this is a major task. Uh, for, for government. In fact, we've got meetings with the University of Manchester next week to, 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 to take some uh, some steps on this, but I agree it's, it's a very important point. But we've got to uh, another question um, online. Uh, Jay Amin, who's a freelance consultant. Jay? Are you still there? Or maybe you're not, maybe you need to unmute. Or am I going to count you out? Oh, you've gone. But David Goodhart, who was going to chair this uh, meeting until he went down with COVID. So, uh, so David, so you, you, if you're well enough, you can make a, you can ask your question now. Great. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Paul? Yes. If you speak up a little bit. All right. Okay. Um, I'm not on death's door. I've got a very mild dose. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, thank you, Richard. Very good talk. Um, it kind of made me think about the sort of catch-20 to when you were talking about vicious circles and virtuous circles, it made me think that actually there's a sort of catch-22 in levelling up, generally, isn't there? That, uh, that companies won't invest in areas unless the framework, perhaps particularly the skills framework, is there. But people with skills won't stay uh, you know, unless they know that the investment is coming. Um, I mean, it's a sort of it's a sort of catch twenty two, isn't it? I mean, how can public authorities finesse this problem? Um, it's a, it's the sort of getting all your ducks in a row problem for for, for for left behind areas. I mean, and do you do you know of any useful academic work that's been done on this? David, and I hope you're, you you get better soon. Uh, I, I think that there's, I think there's been an abiding tendency in policy to think about skills as a supply problem. And I think the point that you make absolutely uh, makes us realise why we can't do that. Skills, you know, the people, the, the reason why, you know, there clearly are very low levels of skills in places like Rochdale and Oldham. And the people, the, the, the reason why there are low levels of skills, it's not really something that you can solve by, uh, by um, creating, you know, lots of skills programs. The people that people, you know, that people are, people everywhere are rational. People won't put the time and money and investment into getting high skills if they think there are no jobs at the, the end of it. So I think... Uh, it's really important for us to try and bring skills policy and innovation policy together. And I think that's something that, frankly, doesn't happen very well in central government. I don't think there's anything like enough conversation between the Department for Education and BASE. Uh, it is something that, it's, that, that I think we can do at a, at a local level. So a, a combined authority, uh, which does have a uh, devolved responsibility for skills, is in a position to be able to bring together the, that, that, that skills agenda and the innovation agenda. And the point is exactly what you make, David. The, to, to break the cycle, you have to create a vision, if you like, for the more innovative, more prosperous economy that you want to have. And you have to um, create the skills that, that will support that, that, that vision at the same time as you try and bring in those measures. It, it could be about... Uh, innovation interventions, uh, inward investment is often very important in these areas. So you have to do the two things together to break the cycle. You have to persuade people that that, that you, you know the economy will be different. You know, and it's uh, if you talk to you know people who do focus groups. I know public first, and people have done many focus groups in left behind places. 
And, you know, one gets a sense of those of cynicism. People think, oh, levelling up, we've heard it all before, people say it's all going to be great and it just stays the same, so why should we bother? So I think that, 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 that there is an important point there about how you can convey a credible, convincing vision for a better economy that will uh, create the demand for skills and then, you know, at the same time as you try and fix the supply by, uh, you know, working, you know, with FE colleges and other skills providers, particularly in that realm, that so important realm of intermediate level skills that I think are so important. I think there was a question that the gentleman was on his phone. Now he's gone back. He's very keen to ask yes. a question. So yes, uh, Hi there. Ed Burkett, Head of Energy and Environment and Policy Exchange. Um, a lot of change is underway in the economy from a transition to lower carbon industries. The levelling up white paper, in my mind, didn't contain that much specifically about low carbon R&D. Uh, do you think they got the balance right, or do you like to see more focus on that? Well, I'd like to see more focus on uh, uh, um, low carbon R&D in general. I think you know it's a huge, massive uh, societal challenge to shift the energy basis of our economy. I think the implications of that are not widely enough understood by policymakers, and I think you know one needs a huge amount of R&D and innovation in order to drive down costs of low carbon energy uh, of, uh, to, 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 to create a system. So I, I think you know my starting point is yeah low carbon R and D is really important. It should be you know ruthlessly focused on getting costs down, and uh, we, we we should do more of it. We probably will end up doing more of it in 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 places that are um, that you know in places that are not in the greater southeast. You know I I think. I, I am pleased by the government's new appetite for new nuclear build. I think that's really important. You know, we're not going to be building small modular reactors in in in, in the southeast. That's something that it will will happen in the north. Uh, carbon capture is a technology I'm not enormously keen on, but it may we may have to do it. That will happen. You know, that will be a technology that happens in in Teesside. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done in retrofit. In uh, you know, I mean, the gas price crisis is a really good example. You know, what should we do about the, the the current gas price crisis? Well, frankly, there's not much we can do. It's what should we have done ten years ago, and what we should have done ten years ago is uh, get on with nuclear new build, get on with uh, large scale retrofitting of houses. And so, you know. The best time to do it was 10 years ago. The second best time to do it is about now. So we need to get on with that. So I do think that that's a massive area. And I think, even, to be honest, I suppose, even without a lot of intervention, it will naturally happen outside the, uh, the southeast. But I think you, you know, it, 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 there, there are many uh, uh, things that we should do. You know, so in Manchester, I think... You know, the kind of new materials you need, new modular building techniques, what you need to do to retrofit commercial buildings, what you need to do to create social housing, uh, uh, you know, low carbon um, social housing that can be heated with low carbon as energy efficient. This, this is just a massive, massive task. I think we've got time just for one more question, if you don't mind, Richard. Yeah. For online from uh, Nico, Nico, Nico McDonald from the Research and Development Society. Nico. Hi there. Uh, thank you for a really uh, enlightening talk, Richard. Um, I picked up on your question. Uh, I, I'm also affiliated with London South Bank University of Arts and Creative Industries. Um, your point about the need for cultural change in UKRI and Innovate UK, and uh, I've been involved in bidding for lots of things to those organisations, um, going all the way back to the uh, uh, DTI technology programme and so on. Um, my experience in those organisations is they're often quite disconnected. You know, you say, you know, are they in Swindon or Whitehall or whatever? They're quite disconnected from actually what's happening on the ground and outside the formal R&D centres, not least in creative industries, which Kat drew uh, from the Design Council flagged up. Uh, and they've, in the last 15 years, tried to create a level playing field to fairly fund. But somehow they always end up funding the reliable but not often very innovative partners who often don't deliver, at least don't deliver as much as more innovative uh, funding might. And I wonder if you might, uh, what you would think about the idea of um, trying to, not least because we're talking about leveling up across the UK, uh, having a sort of command that they get out there and actually find out what's happening on the ground in the unusual places, 
uh, outside the Cambridge Oxford Triangle, uh, outside the big R and D centres, uh, and so on, outside the catapult centres as well, and also give them more discretion in who they fund because smaller, often more innovative companies don't really know how to do those funding bids. They don't have people to pay for them, you know, fund writing, uh, consultants, and so on. And yet they really deserve funding, but the level playing field actually means, I think, that those kind of organisations don't get the funding that they deserve. They may not even know about it. What do you think about that as a proposal? Yeah, no, I think that's really important. And, you know, I should say, I, you know, I was on the council of EPSRC for five years. It's, an, you know, I think there are many good people in the in, in the council. I think it's the, the research councils do have many innovative and, uh, and, and creative thinking people. I think we have seen more... Uh, um, and I think you know you're absolutely right. There's no uh, substitute for getting out and going to uh, going to visit people and going you know just getting out on the road and uh, uh, looking for where that innovation happens. And I think you know we do see more of that. But I think you know you, you're right. Innovate UK for companies. I know it's not a particularly easy organisation for them to deal with, and there is a tendency large companies uh, do particularly well. I mean. The North West, for example, actually Innovate UK is, uh, um, is, uh, doesn't particularly do well at funding companies in the North West, and I think that's a function of the fact that the companies do tend to be smaller, they tend to be SMEs, they haven't got the, the, the resources to devote to, 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 to chasing those grants. So I think you know, there's work to be done both in engagement, they need to get out and engage more, I think you know the bureaucracy needs to be slimmed down a little bit. It's uh, not they're, they're, these are not uh, always easy things for busy companies to deal with. So I, I think you know the mandate that they have. I think is in the, the, the new mandate to think about levelling up more. I think is important, and I think it you know the, 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 those the things that you suggest are exactly what they need to do. They just need to get out and find those innovative, innovating companies and work out how they can help them better. No, just comment on that. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's a very important question because, uh, for example, you know, research councils often call for multidisciplinary work, and they all said this is our priority. But then when the proposals come in, of course, they go for the discipline specialists who mark it down. So there, there, is, a, there is a problem there. I'm, I'm thinking, I've, I've advocated for some time that a proportion of each uh, research council's budget should be, if you like, just simply for blue sky, almost given at random, um, because a lot of the research which is funded, as you say, is really re research whose results are already known, almost in advance. So they're not really doing, you know, highly evaluated work. But that's just a, a particular hobby horse of mine. Uh, but much more importantly, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Richard very much, not only for uh, you know the uh, the depth and the breadth of his contribution. Uh, but the excellent way with which you've dealt with uh, a very wide variety of uh, challenging and interesting questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.